Let me get you to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I want to read that opening verse. I'm not going to ask you to stand tonight. Uh, Brian's not like me. I know who Bernie and Arnie are, and I know it hurts your knees and legs sometimes, so we'll let you sit still tonight. But I want to read this one verse as we open up, and I want to share with you what I have entitled Seven Kingdom Virtues. Now, whether we get through all of them or not, I don't know. I don't plan to go any farther than a Pastor does on Wednesday night. But here's something that I was reading last night uh, after chapel, and I was sitting there by myself, and let me see uh, uh, this hang on a minute okay verse 5 and I want you to keep this in your mind 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5 for we preach not ourselves but Jesus Christ the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus sake the reason that you teach a class, you lead singing, you do special music, you study your Bible, whatever it is, that you might you are, might be a better servant. You're not here to be entertained. Amen? Amen? You're here to learn how to be a better servant for the Lamb of God. That's why we have our Wednesday night uh, prayer time, where pastor teaches us the Word of God, where the children are taught here each Wednesday night and down in the uh, fellowship hall. I think tonight, I don't think I know tonight, I believe I know why our nation is in the condition it's in. And uh, I believe it's this, and we talked about this, I was sharing it with some of the pastors to see what they thought. And I asked those preachers at camp this week so far, I did a survey and I said, if you could go back and start over what would you change the most? Now these are pastors, independent Baptist preachers. What would you change the most if you could go back and start your ministry all over again, what would it be? And every single one of them, individually, privately, said, I wish I had been a better soul winner. Now pastor preaches that and he teaches that, and most of us are not. He had said something about five or six weeks ago on methods and ways to be a soul winner. And I took him up on that and I started praying. Actually, I actually fought and argued with God over it. I, Lord, I don't want my friends and my nephews and all of them to get upset with me. But God finally won the battle, amen to that. And I got a card and wrote a little note in it and just took one of our tracks and put it in it. I sent it to a Catholic in Marquette, Michigan, up, Upper Michigan. I sent one to my nephew who has told me time and time again he does not want anything to do with God. He's 44 and on his way to hell and I sent one to a millionaire that we rented from when we lived in Gladys as God laid it on my heart. The one from Gladys who believes that God is real but he cannot accept that Jesus is God. And I said, Bob, until you do, you're going to die and go to hell. He just cannot and will not believe it. The gentleman in Michigan was quite upset with me. This was my best friend. We were in battle together in Vietnam 49 years ago. How dare you send me a track? I said, I sent you the track because I'm concerned about your soul. I want to know for sure that you're going to be in heaven forever. And he proceeded to tell me what he does through the Catholic Church in order to get there. I proceeded to tell him the only thing I had to do was get on my knees and confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen. And that's been 55 years ago. So there's a lot of ways we're here to serve. Pastor asked me uh, a week or two ago, he, can you fill in? And I, I, I like to tease sometimes. You folks know how I am. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, can you come back and, and do the lesson? And I heard a, a whisper. I don't know if he heard it or not, but kind of under their breath. Well, why does he have to come back? Why doesn't the pastor come back? Well, the pastor is five hours away. I'm 62 miles. If I do the speed limit, I can be here in an hour and 20 minutes. I'm a servant. I'm serving with my pastor to serve you tonight. So what are some of the virtues? You know, when you hear about heaven, the only time you hear about heaven is when you're at a funeral. Nobody ever thinks about heaven. I reminded a congregation in Christiansburg last fall, you need to remember who you are. A child of the king. Say amen to that one. Amen. And you, you need to remember where you're going. You're not going to stay in this world forever. 
God has promised a home. I mean, it took him six days to cre create all the universe. And he's been preparing a place for you and me for 2,000 years. That where he is, there we might be also. Now let me get you to John chapter 1. I'm going to use scripture. You may have time. If you don't, just write them down. John chapter 1 and verse 14. And I'm pretty sure I'm not going to go too quick that we won't get all these virtues. This is what should be evident in our lives as we go out to serve. It's like Pastor uh, Brother Matt came tonight. He came to serve. He leads the congregation in music. Elizabeth and Abigail came to youth camp Sunday night to serve. They got up and they sang to 200 young people. And then I got up and preached the word of God. They're doing their part. And God doesn't look at this as, as, as Matt's singing, uh, leading the singing, more important as uh, maybe me teaching the word of God. I think that if we look at the word of God, when we put it all together, we're here for one reason, to give glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Amen. And when you walk out of this building tonight, can you say this? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory, as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The first virtue tonight, today in our world, the ruling value seems to be, and it is, tolerance. You know, everything is okay if it doesn't harm or hinder another person. Amazingly, so-called Christians today think homosexuals are okay. Now, we need to hate the sin, but we need to love the sinner. And it's been okay, I mean... Roanoke Valley's accepted it, and the proof is Metropolitan Church downtown. That's a homosexual, gay, lesbian type church. How do they preach around that from what the Word of God says? So, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody, as long as it doesn't harm anybody, do your own thing. In other words, in today's society, there's no right and there's no wrong. If, you feel, if it feels good, do it. So we wonder today, why is, in, why is God being kicked out of the schools and out of the government and, and, and out of homes and even out of our churches tonight? Bob and, and Joel and I were discussing a, a church situation. And we forget, folks, here is the ruling, here's the ruling authority of any Christian. This is the ruling authority of any church. And if it ain't in the book, forget it. If it is in the book, stand for it whether you want to or not. Amen. But we live in that time where the sinful activities are totally accepted. Except the homosexuals. Except abortion. Do you know that they're killing, killing one million babies every 14 days? Every 14 days, a million babies in America are aborted. When's the last time you asked God to give us the wisdom to stand up such, against such evil? I'm glad my mother didn't abort me. Now, when I look at some of you, I don't know about it, but you know. <laughs> But I'm glad Mama said no. As a matter of fact, when we were growing up, my mom was raising six sons. They told my mother, I mean, Mama had five boys times she's 21. And they told Mama, said, you ought to separate these kids and so they have a chance. And my mom said, they're my sons, I love them, and I'm going to raise them. And she did. We didn't have a whole lot, but she raised us to fear God. She took us and made us go to the house of God. So we as children of the King find our lives are formed by truth. Um, I won't go into detail, but there was someone that asked the question, said, uh, you know, does the Bible say this? And I said, no, it does not. They said, yes, it does. I said, okay, show me in the Bible where it says that. I don't know exactly where it is, but it's in there. You have no argument unless you know where it's at. And so I took the individual to the scripture and I said here's what the scripture says and he said I can't accept that and then you can't accept truth because here's the way it is you can't take what you want and throw the rest of it away it's either all or none it's either all God's word or not we've quizzed these kids these past few weeks and uh, days and trying to get them to interact with other churches and they'll come to us and how many, how many uh, somebody tell me how many books is in the Bible how many is in the Old Testament 30 who 39 how many is in the New Testament do a little subtractive what would you say brother 27 
66 books. Now, we don't write love letters anymore. They, they text everything. Uh, that's one thing, I, I, and I love my pastor to pieces, but I said, Brother Brian, if you want to see me, don't text me. Pick the phone up, and I want to hear your voice. He said, well, you can text me back. I said, I don't know how. He said, are you that simple? I said, yes. <laughs> Technologically, I, I'm computer ignorant. I, it took me a year to figure out how to work my flip phone. And then when I did figure out how to work it, I throwed it against the wall. I had to buy another one. Just frustrated me. But this thing of truth has to be in your life. Now, we have the society today, and we're seeing it in the churches, when it comes to truth, people will not say, oops, I told a lie. Whoops, I told a little white fib. You know what they say today? I misspoke. That sounds better than saying lied. But misspeaking and lying is the same thing. So if you don't build your life on truth, number one, you better question whether you're a child of the king and whether you're headed home to a place called heaven. Because I believe the Lord's coming. And we as the people of God have remained silent. We don't, we, don't want to, we don't want to talk about the church. We don't want to talk about Jesus. We don't want to talk about politics. We just want to come in, get a little lesson, and go out and we're okay. If you come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, read your Bible once a week and pray, you ain't much of a Christian. It goes a whole lot deeper than that. How many of you would admit, and you men are sitting here, and if your wives are sitting next to you, you better admit it. How many of you men will admit you're still in love with your wife? Nobody? <laughs> Thank you. You better get that in up, brother. Still in love with your wives. Just as much as not more. We were sitting out this morning, I was sitting out this morning about 2.30 and that big yellow moon and steel, sticky air and just sitting there thinking all the years that we have been married, all the years that we've been in ministry, everything that we have done together and every step of the way, Nancy and I believe that this is the truth. So it has to be studied. Paul said, study to show thyself a proved a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, God didn't say you had to argue it. He just said you had to present it. But if you don't know it, you can't present it. So number one, that virtue that should be in our lives is truth. Jesus said by his own very nature that he was truth. Our source is the word of God. We're true to his word, his love, and the confidence that we have in God that God cannot lie. Titus 1 and verse 4 says it's impossible for God to lie. Now I've given my testimony many times and for time's sake alone tonight, but the lady that was leading me to the Lord probably weighed about 240 pounds. And she knelt down next to me, and she opened the Bible, and she started going through Romans Road. This is in the country church in 1962. When she got done, she said, Bobby, do you understand what I said? I said, no, ma'am. And I hadn't. I tried, but I couldn't figure out what she said. She explained the plan of salvation the second time. Do you understand? No, ma'am. I'm sure by this time, she thought, boy, this is one ignorant country boy. You know, he don't know nothing. Patiently, she started going through the plan of salvation the third time, and I listened. And as I listened, the Holy Spirit opened my mind, opened my heart, and let me see that I was a sinner, and I was lost, and I was going to hell. And I shouted out in, in a, a congregation of 300 and some people on a Sunday morning, an old country church, I got it! You know what a witch doctor told me many years ago? As he was dying, Jerry Young and I were in the jungles of the Amazon, and we were visiting some of these villages that had been one to the Lord. And I looked at him, and down there, the old people are called father, or if they're a woman, mother. But they have authority. And I looked at him, and I, I'm in that society, so I want to do what that society do, does. And I said, Father, do you still know Jesus Christ? Now, this was the guy that Satan had for 70 some years before he got saved. That old witch doctor looked up at me and Jerry and Gary Dawson. His eyes got a little bit big, filled up with tears, and he said, Mr. Preacher, through an interpreter, because I didn't understand the language. He said, years ago, 
I hung my hope on Jesus and it's still hanging there. We can know. We, we, we've got a wonderful future ahead of us. Folks, we, we ought to be excited. I know that I told some preachers last night, it's no fun getting old. Not that I'm getting old, but it's no fun getting a little bit older. I mean, your, your body aches and your head aches, and, and even if you ain't got a brain, your head aches. You look at some of you folks and it really aches, but anyway... We've got such a wonderful future. And God challenges us to take his word and go out and present the truth to a lost and dying world. Uh, what was the name of that group that was here that we were talking to in the Master's Quartet? Or the Master's Hand. And Joel and I were sitting up here talking. Do you remember that conversation? Man, it stuck in my mind. And that gentleman that stood over here had a long coat on. Used to be a pastor, I think. He said, uh, we go into 160-some churches every year. 70% of them don't have a pastor. We're talking about Bible-believing churches. And I thought, man, that's terrible. Then he said this, it really shocked me. 70% of them don't want a pastor. We have come to the time in our lives in this world where the sheep... No longer want an under shepherd. They want to do it themselves. They want to run it their way. This church is where God allows you to be a servant for him. It doesn't belong to you. You're just keeping it up for the next generation that comes along. We're in it for souls to see people get saved. To see the people of God grow and mature in the Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot be done without truth. And then if you look at John chapter 8 and verse 11. John chapter 8. And I'm sure that some of you have heard these before but it's always good to uh, Paul told Timothy put them in remembrance of these things we seem to forget but in verse 8 he said and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one beginning at the eldest even unto the la last and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst and when Jesus had lifted himself up he saw that none but the woman, and he said unto her, Woman, where are thy, thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You know, because of grace, we get a second chance. When Adam and Eve fell, God could just wipe the whole slate clean, start all over, but he didn't do it. Except for you that are Bible teachers like Joel, perhaps Brother Ratliff back there, how many times did God give the Ten Commandments to Moses? Okay, I heard one answer. Anybody else? Once? Twice? That's exactly right. Remember when Moses came down the first time? What were they doing? Pate! They had forgotten all of God's laws. Moses had gone up. And Moses became so angry, what did he do? He cast them down and broke them. He had to go up, and God had to write him a second time. Now, to me, that's the very beginning as I studied the word. That's grace. God said, okay, you've destroyed the law. That's it. I ain't having anything else to do with the Jews. You see, we have a God of second chance. Now, the scripture doesn't say it, and I'm not trying to write anything into it, but I would like to believe that Jesus was writing on the ground how he gave the Jewish ancestors of these religious people a second chance when he wrote the law two times. Same law, but he gave them grace. And God bestows grace upon you and upon me. I was excited when the pastor asked me to come back. I was excited. It's not the knowledge. It's not the people. It's not any of that. I get a chance to teach the Word of God. And as you already know, I'd rather do this than anything. I'd rather preach than anything in the world, including eating. And I like to eat. So does Jeffrey Pass and Jack and some of these others. We got chest of drawer disease. Her chest fell in her drawer. She'll get it after a while, okay. They tried to discredit the Lord. We got some neighbors that we try to, and we do. We live for them. We don't try, but it's not hard to live for us in front of unsaved people. They don't clean up nothing. They got the worst, filthiest language you ever heard. 
And my wife was standing out the fence a couple of months ago, and she was talking to this lady, wasn't badging or anything. And the lady looked at her, and she said, I want to tell you, and you tell that preacher husband of yours. I don't want anything to do with your God. Nothing. A few weeks later, I was standing at the fence talking to her. She said, did your wife give you that message? I said, she sure did. She said, and I mean it. I said, Michelle, one day you're going to want to have something to do with my God, but he's not going to want to have anything to do with you. Because he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. There will come a day you wish you had done and that you'd bestow grace. If God can bestow grace upon us and save us and give us a second chance and a third chance and a 50th chance or whatever, why can't we bestow grace on others? We're the king's kids. People are watching our lives, saved and unsaved, are watching us tonight. When I got out of my truck down in Spencer, down there in the backwood country somewhere, and I had to put some air in my tires, I had on the Springs of Life, youth camp. I had on a t-shirt. And I went in the store to pay and she said Springs of Life, I know what that is. And the lady started asking questions about Springs of Life. And I had just a brief window to tell her who owned the camp. Technically the churches that supported on it, but it belongs to the Lord Jesus. And people are getting saved. God's still in the saving business. He's still showing grace. So maybe God wants you tonight to leave this place, take the truth, the Word of God, don't argue it, don't try to prove it, just take it out and show the grace that God has shown to you. Because if God was the holy God that He said He was, and if He did not love you, He would not have bestowed grace, and you and I would have died and went to hell. But because of His grace, He did. He forgave us of all sin in our lives. He forgave them. Show grace. In eternity, it's going to abound all over heaven. And then if you look at Matthew 22 and verse 34, and I won't read all of this. It goes down to verse 40. It talks about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 22, verse 34. To love somebody, whether we want to or not, requires us to reach out to other people. If you really love your God and your neighbor, it's going to require you to step out, knowing that you may be rejected, you may be laughed at, and share the Word of God with that individual. I've learned over the years that if you approach people gently with the truth, Sometimes they'll listen. If you come at it and knock them over the head, they're going to they're gonna run and go the other way. And I'm not ashamed to tell people, you know, there's a heaven and there's a hell. There's nothing in between. I've got more friends on the other side than i got on this side. i got most of my years of my life behind me. If I live to be 70, I've only got three years left. Yeah, three years left. Nancy's already 70. Her time's up. <laughs> no, not really. Show them the grace. You can't do it unless you have truth. And you can't do the truth and the grace unless you show love. To reach out to other people, it means to yield ourselves and our resources to others' needs. We can tell how much we love God by the way we treat others. And I share this tonight. I hope it comes out humble because it's the way I mean it. Just a few short years ago, I was pastoring. And I was lucky to get enough money to pay my bills and buy my food. But God always met the need. Then God did some extraordinary things in our lives. And he turned the whole thing around. And Brian knows the whole story. He's sworn to secrecy, so he's not going to tell anybody. And I can now take any money that a church may decide to give to me. And I can set it over here. And God can say, that person needs 100 that person needs 50. That person needs 500. It's what we've always wanted to do. And you know what we found out? And Joel said it tonight, and I've known it for years. God's shovel will always be bigger than your shovel. And it takes love, and it takes grace, and it takes truth to be able to do it. I could be putting that money away. I reminded the guys I shouldn't have done it. Uh, Mike Vest and Daniel Boone, some of these guys I've known for years. I was my last year at camp. I want a Cadillac for Friday. They presented it to me last night. I couldn't get in it. I couldn't get my big toe in that Cadillac. A little matchbox that somebody bought at Kennedy's over here in Boone's Mill. And here it is, brother. There's your Cadillac. 
Aren't you glad the reward is far greater on the other side than it is on this side? It takes love. It takes truth. It takes mercy to do what God's called us to do. So, by the way, we treat other individuals. Now, the Lord said we're to love everybody. He didn't say anything about liking them. You can go back and look it up. But actually, if you don't like them, you'll never learn to love them. And there are some people over the years that I've been in church that I just soon not be around them. It was hard to love them. Lord, how do I love that lady? How do I love that woman? You know how they are and the bitter spirit that they have. And Christ would constantly remind me, love them through my eyes. Go to the Word of God and see the world and love the world through the eyes of Jesus Christ. I used to have a woman sit on the third row. It wasn't this woman, okay? But she sat over here on the outside aisle. I, honest to goodness, that was the, the most miserable person. I don't even know why she came to church. Never smiled, sat there, growled, and mumbled, and grumbled the whole uh, service. And I asked her one time, I said, why are you coming to church? She said, just to aggravate you. <laughs> <clears throat> I said, I don't need you. The devil gives me enough aggravation. I don't need you coming to give me any. No love. Didn't have the truth. Didn't have the word of God hidden in her heart that she might not sin against God. And by the way, anger and all these things, that's a sin against God. And God has forgiven us of those sins. So I was telling Brother Jeff tonight, you know our Lord's been through enough. Do you think he's sitting on the throne tonight disappointed in some of us? I know he's been disappointed in me a few times. And I know Satan has accused me, as the Bible said, he's there daily accusing the brethren before the throne of God. And he's accusing me, look at that, there's Bob Andrews. If he's really saved, he wouldn't be doing that. And time after time after time, for 55 years, the king has stepped up and he said, he's mine. That's a child of the king. He belongs to me. His sins is under the blood. Aren't you glad tonight that when God looks at you, he don't see any sin. All he sees is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. Now, that doesn't mean go out here and act like a bunch of hogs. I met a guy at camp. Now, I don't say this as easy as I can. as an illustration. And uh, he was with a missionary, and they were going to the Roanoke bus station. Now, if you know about anything about Roanoke, don't go downtown after dark. It's a rough place down there, especially around the bus station. And this guy's from Nigeria. And uh, he's sitting there with a the missionary, and this... Uh, Wino comes up, this black wino comes up and begins to talk to him. And uh, in Nigeria, when they don't want you around, they go, shoo, 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 get away, shoo. That's the way they do it. We just tell them to take a hike. He said, you're not from around here, are you? Chester said, nope, I'm from Nigeria. He said, oh, you're one of those real. And then he used the N-word. He said, we're just a watered, watered down kind over here. You know what Chester said to him? He said, you don't have to be. You can be a child of the king if you want to be. Right. 1 a.m. in the morning, downtown Roanoke, he's witnessing to somebody that feels like the whole world owes him everything and making a joke of his own race and not seeing the everlasting God. And this Nigerian missionary tells him how he can get home. That's love. That's truth. That's grace. Do we experience it in our own lives? And then I want to take you to Philippians chapter 2, and I'll read these verses to you. Go back over to Philippians 2 and down to verse uh, 3. Now, Philippians comes just before Colossians. Find Colossians, you're there. Go back a couple of pages, okay? Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. Let me make sure I got the right one here. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ, having no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in, in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he had, wherefore he might trust in the flesh, 
I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things are gained to me, I count it loss of Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Success in the kingdom is going to be measured on how successful a servant you were down here. If you could go back to the beginning of your Christian life, whenever it started, some have been saved as long as me or longer, some have just a little while. But if you could go back, what would you change? You know, so many people come in the house of God and they sit down and they say, okay, put your hand, bless me or I'm not coming back. But if you come in with a servant's attitude, you will leave with a servant's attitude. Lord, who can I talk to tomorrow? Is there somebody down there at the store? Is there somebody at the grocery store? Is there somebody that's paying the bill? Lord, who is it that needs you that I can put a track in the mail and say I'm praying for you and mail that track out? 49 cents is not a whole lot for a soul. And you don't know who's going to get saved. That track is jammed full, that track rack. And we had tons of them here. All you have to do is just grab a handful and take them with you. That's a way to witness. Success. When I look, and I, and I do, and I, I've known Brother Joel 30 years or longer, and I tell everybody I meet. And folks, I've been in a lot of churches, and I've heard a lot of teachers. We're very blessed to have one of the best. He's one of the best. You know why? He loves the Lord. He loves the Word of God. And all the time I've been listening to him, he ain't taught me any untruth yet. When he does, I'm out of his class. But he teaches the truth. How in the world can he find that in Hosea? I've seen that. Some, where in the world did he find that? And then as he begins to explain it, I begin to understand it. Servanthood. You guys that work with the kids week after week, ain't that fun? Hot, sticky weather, bus kids, and then bus kids are rough. But you've got to remember, they got a rough home life. You might win one or two of them to the Lord. They sit up here and they, they don't know how to be quiet. They don't know when to quit talking. You got to tap them on the shoulder. You got to tell them to behave. But you're being a servant. That's what I'm doing tonight. I'm being a servant. I'm standing here in the place of the pastor trying to get you to see. And then 1 John 2, 16. Now I know if you're going to be a servant, if you're going to be a king's kid, if you're going to have this virtue, then you better look real deep in your heart tonight. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. I need to read that. I've got about four minutes, and so I will. Uh, 1 John 2, 16. 1 John, let's see, that comes out there. 1 John comes out there. Comes before 2 John, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, I know where I'm going right now. 1 John 2 and verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The fifth thing, and I won't get the other two till next time. One of the virtues that we need to show is self-control. You know, folks, we got it built into us that we deserve this. I worked a long time. I deserve this much money. I worked a long time. I deserve that new truck, that new car, that new house, that new girlfriend, whatever it is. And when you see people explode, no self-control whatsoever. And I've seen this happen so many times. And the lost are standing there and wondering. Well, now wait a minute. He said he was a Christian. He acted like that. Now we're just human beings. My mom used to tell me to count to ten. I didn't have much self-control, so I counted to a hundred. Because <laughs> I, I, I had a short fuse as a teenager. But as the years went by, God began to control my temper and my spirit that the person I'm dealing with might be saved and going through. I have no idea what you're going through this week other than heat. I have no idea whether your finances are, are down. And I heard, and I've known her for years, Sister Carolyn there. She said she was distressed because she can't find a home. First she prays God to sell a house. He does. Now she's distressed. <laughs> 
because she's looking for a place, something in the price range that she can afford. I say to you, my sister, don't be distressed. Just trust me. He's been taking care of you a long time. And he's going to keep on taking care of you. But it's an honest request from her. Pray that I'll find a place that I can afford to buy. Most of us, it goes, Phew. we don't think any more about it. That's why she's distressed, because we're not praying. Or Miss Tammy back there about a job, or Brother Joel's daughter's going out of state for a couple of days to, to do a wedding. I think that's what they told me. They're going to Florida to do a wedding, pictures and all that. Uh, we get distressed because we don't pray. So what about you tonight? Do you have any of these virtues whatsoever? Do you have that self-control and that love and that servanthood? And that's what the people of God need. Here's what's happened to our church in closing. We forgot who we are. And we forgot our way home. We think we're going to live in this life forever. We will when we come back. But this human life is so brief. It's the training ground for where we're going to live forever. So go out tonight determined that I'm going to ask God for the love and the grace and the self-control and these things that I need in my life that I can be a better servant to the people that are around me. Heads are bowed, would you please? Uh, I appreciate you coming tonight and listening. It's about 10 minutes to 8. And I'm not going to keep you any longer. I've got two more points, but I would have to keep you longer, and I'm not going to do that. Get it next time we come. But if you're here tonight and you're willing to say, you know, preacher, God touched me about one of those points or two of those points or all five of them. I would appreciate you praying for me. And you, just put your hand up. I'm not going to ask you to come. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand back there. God's touched my heart. Here's what you need to do. Just give it to the Lord. Just give it to the Lord. Lord, I need help in this area. I want to be my very best for you. I want to be that witness for you. I want to make sure that I know the truth where I don't have to argue it, but just present it. And God, if there's anything in my heart that is holding back my relationship with you, you show that to me. And let me find my way back to where I can serve you better than I've been serving you. Father, we thank you.